Welcome to Dap and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two cousins who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Monica. And uh, as you can see, we both look like trash right now. Yes, I do have to admit, we, we are filming on a, our day that we normally don't film. We normally film on Saturday, but Saturday was Halloween. And, um, and then the morning afterwards, Sunday, um, I was not feeling super hot. And I just think it carried over to this morning. Um, it's I, a lot um, better than yesterday morning, but still pretty yeah, rough. I worked today. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I worked a full day, and um, also it, our exams, our final exams for the first semester start on Friday, so it's not exactly the least stressful time of work for me. That's fair. Um, so, um, I'm still doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, this week was I, I kind of exciting getting ready for Halloween. The seasonal depression has kicked in because uh, now that Halloween has ended, I have no reason to be excited. Um, but there, there was some good things that had happened this week. I told Mary Kate I will be talking about this on the podcast. Um, so I, there is a, a band that I listen to called Ice Nine Kills. Uh, if you listen to this podcast, um, I highly suggest that you would listen to this band. It, they're, they sing about horror movies and horror, um, not even just horror uh, writings, like uh, literature, but they sing about other literature as well. Um, and they are more of a heavier type of music, so proceed with caution if you're not into that. But if you are and you like creepy horror stuff, I highly suggest listening to this band. Um, I think on the 29th, they had a live stream concert uh, and I bought a ticket for it. And it was on Which a I told TV. her it was a waste of money because you can just watch them play live on YouTube. I don't understand live stream concerts. That is very true, but they also made it a mix of a horror movie as well. So, like, the live stream part of it, when their faces would pop up on the screen, was all, like, a movie. So, like, there was, like, a killer. It was really cool. And um, I had never gotten to see them live, and this makes me want to see them live even more. Like, they put on one hell of a show. Um, and I also um, was freaking honored with the greatest privilege I think ever uh, for me. It's one of the greatest. Because I do say if any of the boys from Five Thoughts did follow me on Instagram, I think it would also be up there. But Spencer Carnes, the lead singer of Ice Nine Kills, followed me on Instagram and messaged me back. Um, so that was something that I was processing for a few days after that live stream. Um, if this man ever listens to this podcast, first of all, hi, Spencer. I hope you're enjoying this little plug that I'm giving your band. Second, he probably isn't listening, but I'm going to pretend that he is. Second, he will be a host on the, like, he, he will be a guest star on this podcast. <coughs> My mom won't even listen. Come on, Mary Kate, you gotta give us some hope. Bro, he can make the podcast grow. He can be like, yo, broski, I heard it. It's fantastic. I like talking about horror stuff. I do have very exciting news. I forgot some, I didn't forget that it happened, but I forgot like that something very good did happen to me this week. Courtney and I have a nephew. Yes, um, the, the, my old roommate, who's how Courtney and I met, um, she had her baby on October 28th. He's perfect. Aww. He is perfect. I have a nephew. Um, also, we promise this episode is coming out on November 8th, and November 12th is Courtney's birthday, so happy birthday, Courtney! Happy birthday, Courtney! Thank the you only for probably Scorpio that I am friends with. The only Scorpio that seems normal that I've met. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I tell her all the time, I don't know how, I don't, I don't understand. She doesn't, yeah. Her rising is probably like a Virgo or something. 
I don't know if I'm friends with her on CoStar. Let me check. Moon might be a Virgo. She did comment on Instagram today that she loved the astrology section of our podcast. So maybe go, Courtney. Birthday. <laughs> Um, her rising is a Libra and her moon is a Gemini. That also makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's also weird for me because I normally don't get along very well with Geminis. But I also have a Scorpio moon. Yeah. So, um, what make you think what it makes you think of me. I don't the, only, the only thing we are not compatible on in our charts is love and pleasure, which is fine. Yeah, I, as long as you're not trying to date Courtney, I think everything's okay. Yeah, every otherwise we're good. But um, her uh, what is it? Her her Mercury, which is communication, is in Sagittarius, and mine is in Aries. So like we're both that it makes perfect sense and yeah. her and i both have a jupiter no a saturn in aquarius so like oh. so we we make sense it makes sense it's just the sun sign i just have never met a scorpio that i liked other than her just kidding i dated a scorpio for five years what am i talking about <laughs> Spicy. I will never date another Virgo male as long as I live. That's all I've ever dated. I want to say I'll never date another Scorpio, but... You like to keep it spicy, Mary-Kate. Anyway. Spice. We are starting season two of Hemlock Grove. Now, before we actually start the season. I wanted, I looked up just general, what, what are people saying about season two? And um, Metacritic gave it a uh, generally unfavorable rating. Screen Rant said, hey, it's actually watchable. Which is not as promising as I would hope. Yeah. <clears throat> and Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 55%, but the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes was a 77%. And like the critic consensus on Rotten Tomatoes was um, that it's much better than season one. It's not as disjointed and they upped the gore and scary to make it a little bit more of a real true horror. So like, we'll see. I mean, from the conversation that me and you had this morning alone about um, the uh, episode, the first episode we talked about feels a bit disjointed, but I think it's just putting in all these different storylines that we're going to be following this yeah. season. But we felt that way about the first episode of the first season, too, that it was just too much at once. Yeah, and um, I, I feel like they're putting down the basis for what the main story is, but I feel like there's going to be added factors here and there throughout the rest of the I think of my problem is that I didn't feel compelled or liking any character in this episode. Yeah. I did not like anyone. That's very fair. Like I, even, I, even characters that I genuinely like, I did not care at all what they were yeah. doing this story. And I don't know if that is because of writing, because of acting, because of um, just where the plot is right now. Yeah. I just, I didn't care. See, I feel like it might be based on where the plot is right now. Because, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, the scenes that Peter and Roman were also in, like, 
they I think their acting hasn't gotten any worse. Um, Price was still carrying himself the same way he was in season yeah. one. Yeah. Um, Just actually, I, no. Honestly, if I had to, I mean, obviously we'll talk about it later, but Price was probably the character I cared the most about what his storyline was in this episode. That's very, I can understand that 100% with what went down. Um, but, you know, it, it's a, we're, we're not expecting anything super juicy to be happening in the first episode of a new season. Yeah. It. And, um, it's there, just there funny are- because I think the reason I was so disappointed was because last season, even when I didn't like the story, I loved the characters. And this first episode, I just didn't care. I just think it might be because where everyone was left off, we're trying to, we went from like a bromance, a crazy mother, a weird scientist, and like all that type stuff. So now and everything's every- just kind of broken. Yeah, it was like because of, and I think that partially falls on how they ended the last season. I feel it, like we said they ended it open enough to do a second season. But I don't think they were renewed to do a second season at that point. So I they just, just yeah, it it very much felt like starting over. It felt like a spinoff in a weird way. Like we're watching yeah. a spinoff. Yeah, our- it didn't feel quite like the same show. Yeah, which and, may uh, end up being a good thing in the long run. True, but it have- was not. Yeah, um, we did have with last season where maybe starting over is a good thing yeah but the first episode was called blood pressure and it was released on july 11th 2014 so this is actually and that's another thing i wanted to say this is over a year later yes so it's more it's about 18 months later no. 15. It's 15 months later. Mm-hmm. Um, you can definitely tell that time has passed in the boys. They look a lot older. Yeah. And also, again, I waited three weeks and I didn't feel like I cared about the characters anymore. If I had waited 15 months, it would have been very hard for me to get back into. Yeah, for sure. Um, but it did have a 7.6 out of 10 rating on IMDb. The episode did. Well, that's good. So, um, it was directed by a man named Spencer Susser, who has literally zero other television credits. We love that. Um, ever. Including after this. This one episode is the only episode of television he has ever directed. Um, In fact, like he has won a lot of awards for a bunch of short films. And um, he was the director of the Lana Del Rey Summertime Sadness music video. Which is like a hella good music video, but like, okay. Yeah, definitely uh, outside the realm of Hemlock Grove. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have high hopes, to be honest. When I started reading that, I was like, great, great, great. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. written, it was written by Evan Dunsky, who um, doesn't have a ton of TV credit, Um, He wrote some Two and a Half Men, like he wrote some random stuff, but his biggest television thing was that not only was he the head writer, he was the creator of the show Nurse Jackie. Oh. So like he, he's not by any means a bad writer. Just, it's just a very interesting foray because nothing he had done previously was in the realm of horror. Mm -hmm. So Again. And you know what? In a really weird way, with because of 
there, there was some horror aspects to this episode, but a lot of it's scientific and medical because of the scenes that we get with Price as well. well but also, there were, I think, kind of two moments that were very horror movie-ish. But for the most part, it felt very much like a grounded drama. I think that's why I wasn't as invested, because it felt too grounded for these characters. Yeah, that's very fair. But but based on this, the crew, like the, the production of this episode, that makes sense, that that's the feeling I got. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, we did have some really cool special effects in this episode. Um, and I, one of the, uh, um, makeup artists, he did, um, he did, he was the head of the prosthetic department, which, you know, is a very big part of the few scenes that we have seen that has some nice gore to it. Um, his track record, honestly, very impressive, very impressive. He's done, um, The Land of the Dead from 2005, uh, Mandy from 2018. He did two television shows. Um, he did, well, two television episodes for Hannibal. Oh, um, nice. He did makeup for Carrie in 2013. Okay. Uh, saw the final chapter in 2010. And Mary Kay, this one I think you'll be happy for, Repo the Genetic Opera in 2008. He did Repo? He did Repo. Right. His name is Patrick Baxter. I didn't say his name, but <laughs> very it's Patrick. nice. Very nice. Um, and the, it, like, I don't know if you wrote this down, but the the Wolf CG team is the same. They didn't change production companies. Zoic is still the doing same that. production. Yeah, well, because I, I, I watched all the way to the end of the credits because of our mishap with Christina, yeah. and so I was reading the credits. <laughs> I love that. Like, in all honesty, for certain scenes, we'll get more in depth, but this one time, I'm not mad just the CGI, CGI, because it looks like there's a mix of practical and, you know, visual. And I don't mind a healthy dose of both. And yeah. especially the visual is being done properly. I have, I will have zero issue with it. Yeah, I think, I think there are some things that don't make sense to do practically. Yes. The one scene that we see physically could never be done. But they made it look pretty damn real, which I kind of love. So, uh, anything else on our FX team? Uh, that's all I have down. There was, a, there was a lot of other people on the FX team, but I feel like if I sat and read every single person, um, yeah for a while I yeah guess. I mean like I I could really I could talk about all the story editors who helped the writer but like that would just take a long time and like not that their job is not super important but let's we gotta yeah. stop somewhere <laughs> like, yeah I know because if there's a bit like on an episode like this if there's a big special effects you know moment in the show when they're having more than you know two people working on it um I'll probably grab the one who has the most background in horror and talk about them. Yeah. And he seemed to have the most. And, I mean, after I saw Repo the Genetic Opera, I'm like, oh, I have to do him because Mary-Kate would lose her damn shit. Oh. Man, I love it. When I saw that, I was like, oh, she's going to love it. <sighs> you know? Dismemberment and musicals. It just... <laughs> Me when I watch Sweeney Todd, though, in all honesty. <laughs> um, so, the episode blurb. Peter returns to Hemlock Grove in search of money to avoid a, avoid, afford a lawyer for Linda while Roman tries to satiate his newly found appetite. Now, one of my big questions at the end of season one was, how are they going to get Peter back to Hemlock Grove? Well, they did it. In a very strange way. <laughs> um, but then the episode starts in um, East Hampton, Massachusetts. 
which is a real place. Um, it's about, it's just north of the capital of Springfield. It's about an eight hour drive from Pittsburgh. Um, you would pass it if you were going to Brattleboro, driving from New York up, but anyway, <laughs> not, not the point. Um, and this dude, it's just a weird pan of this dude walking into a house and he goes into like the little kid's room and like touches their face and close the window. And then he goes and looks at the parents. And I was very confused. Yeah. And then he goes down to the kitchen and he lights a candle and then he turns on all of the gas in the oven, and opens the oven and sets the candle down and leaves. And boom, the house does the explode. Yeah. And my vote was a, what the fuck mask man, there are children. Yeah, um, the, this scene, I, from what I could gather of it, because it also, right, it goes, uh, when it explodes, we don't see the explosion, we see a burst of light, mm -hmm. and then it goes in the woods with a man whipping himself. No, 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 he is not whipping himself. He is lashing himself, which is a very specific type of whip, and it's a very biblical reference. I very strongly think that we witness an initiation to the cult because it, this is we are we are aware based on the trailer that there is a cult and there are these masked people right and you what. see you see his mask when he's doing the stuff in the kitchen and then he has taken the mask off when he's lashing himself exactly i think what was happening was an initiation because it seems like he knew the people in the house and also there was a third bedroom in the house as well that he did not look into, but the door was open to. So maybe he was a brother, an older brother or something. Um, I don't know. But I feel like this was, because it seemed like he knew those kids and like he knew them enough. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and the candle that he used was one of the like thick, white candles that you see at like um catholic prayer ceremonies and it had yeah. an angel on the candle so uh, could be another we're gonna be I, we deal with biblical references and like uh, we dealt with it last season it would not surprise yeah. me how we do this season yeah um but they are definitely i think we witnessed an initiation that would make more, sense I literally, my note, it says, oh, he's lashing himself. That's super biblical. Yay for cults? Question <laughs> mark. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, because, so a lash is a whip, but it's not just a whip. It's got, I think nine, I might be wrong about that, but it's got nine separate leather straps. And there's usually some kind of rock or glass tied to the leather so that when you whip yourself you're puncturing and tearing when it pulls away that's what that's what they did to jesus before he got on the cross was they lashed his back so it's a very like very biblical reference to be lashing yourself like that yeah yeah i did not know that one yeah but um, and then we go to the credits now I do have some notes about the credits because the 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 images are the same and the music is the same, but um, the names in the credits are not the same. Um, obviously, Freya Tingley and Penelope Mitchell, so uh, Christina and Letha respectively, are no longer in the credits. Um, the four people from last season who stayed in the credits were Famke Jansen. Bill Skarsgård, Landon Lebron, I don't know how to say his last name, and Doug Ray Scott. So that is Olivia, Roman, Peter, and Norman. 
And then the two people who replaced Penelope and Freya are Tio Horn, who plays Destiny, and Joel De La Fuente, who plays Dr. Price. So, yeah, so I knew before this episode even started that Destiny will be a bigger character this season than she was last season because she made it to the credits and not just to the credits. She's before Dr. Price in the credits. Yeah. So. And, um, which, speaking of Destiny and our uh, lovely friends over there, the next scene right after we get back from our lovely credits... There is a party going on in the middle. It of is summer. in Conia, Ohio. In Ohio. Well, people, you know what? No parties like your Ohioans. I don't know. I'm um, And to be honest, I knew what the party was before the party started. I don't know, like, before they showed what it actually was. I just go... There's everybody's laughing and having such a good time, and it's all this family. I'm a hundred percent sure this is a funeral. Yeah, I was. I put down. And I said that's one hell of a funeral. Right. He got the dad sitting in the chair with a cigar in his hand. And his yeah. So apparent. So this is. Um. From what I can tell, this is actually a real Romani tradition. That the funeral is not like the the body is not in a casket the body is like placed in the room as if the person is still there in order for everyone to say goodbye so yeah uncle joe is just sitting in his chair with a cigar and a scotch only his eyes are sewn shut it's real weird yeah yeah um also the one thing that i had also noted Peter has hair now. So it's been long enough, long enough time has passed that his hair has grown back. We don't actually know how much time has passed. But his hair has grown back and it is long. Meg, are we supposed to believe that the amount of time between both seasons was that, like actually how long it took for each season to get put out? I don't think so. Because the first season takes place in a span of about three months. I mean, maybe. But the first, I mean, the first season came out, it was released in April and took place in September, October, November. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe not. Uh, yeah. We'll find out as we go. I just wish that was something that we would have known. Yeah, I, I, I obviously time has passed, but I wasn't really aware. I couldn't figure out how much time, and I think that's kind of important. So yeah, hopefully yeah. we get more about that in the future. Um, um, but so yeah, it's a big gypsy funeral. Everybody's there partying. Destiny shows up, changes out of her real people clothes into her funeral dress so like again naked people within the first five minutes of an episode great just she's not naked but like um basically like peter tells her that he and linda are leaving and they're going to seattle and she should come with him because there's nothing left for her in hamlet grove um some dude is checking her out. His name is Andreas. And I said, get it, Destiny. Yeah, only thing, only thing, um, Destiny and Andreas need to have a conversation. Um, and he remembered her from when she was a nine-year-old child swimming in the creek. And he was a legal adult driving a car for the ice cream truck. Legal adult? Mm. My takeaway was that he was like 16 or 17. True. She was still nine. And then he made a statement saying beautiful young, oh no. He said lovely young girls grow up to be beautiful women, which is creepy, but okay, here's the thing. If he had tried to bone her when she was nine, it would be creepy. True. He saw her 
20, 30 years later and she's hot as fuck. And he's like, yeah, I remember when you were a kid, but like, damn, you grew up. We're both a consenting adults now. Let's do it. So That's fair. it's not, it's not like he was like grooming her since she was a child or stalking her or something like. That's fair. Yeah. But also another thing is like having like see someone like since you were nine to when you were an adult, there's no like, and like, she's like, in her mid to late 20s so at least she, she's probably closer to 30 true and so for him to go that big span of time how would you recognize her from a nine-year-old to an almost 30-year-old woman that's what makes me uncomfortable I mean, but also you have to understand like they're talking about like basically extended family true like obviously like not close enough family that it's a problem that they boned but like it's it's really the one of the uncles makes a comment about how someone like uncle joe's funeral you would have been able to draw a thousand romani but this year there are only maybe a few hundred Mm -hmm. and like how the romani culture is starting to disappear and people want to become true americans so I think we have to remember and understand that we are dealing with a very different culture. Yeah. Still not okay if he like was following her from the time she was nine, but I didn't get that vibe. Yeah, no, I just think that his uh, pickup lines were probably not as smoothly delivered as he could have given them. Yeah, like, but also when they were at a funeral, it was kind of weird. I mean, it was kind of weird to screw in the kitchen anyway, because that happens right afterwards. Yeah, I wrote, like, get it, like my notes say, get it, Das. And then the next says, note says, called it. Yeah, she literally said, let's pipe at this funeral. Like, there was like a 12-year-old boy trying to get into the kitchen. And they're like, nah, I'm going to use the sink to screw you on. Like, hold on, hold on, little mm. Timmy. You gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. At a funeral. Jesus. Mm. I mean, the Ronnie funeral was more of a party, but like still. Yeah. Um, also happening at the same time is some old lady grandma is said that she has a wife for Peter who will sleep his floors and give him babies. And, and then uh, Peter Peter's crying and his mom is like, listen, clean floors, like that's not nothing to cough at. Like yeah. And then she's like, Lita is dead and you need to let her go. Like, you don't obviously have to marry this cousin lady right now, but like, you, you got to let her go. Yeah. Um, so we know that no matter how much time has passed, which has been enough for Peter's hair to grow back, he is still not okay. Yeah, he's still desperately missing his Letha. And then his mom was like, you would have been a really good dad. And I'm like, don't fucking pour salt in the wound. Exactly. It's like, yeah, I fucking know I would have been a good dad. Too bad she's dead and the baby is as well. Yeah. Like, I literally wrote down, poor, poor, poor Peter. Yeah. I just wrote, Peter is not okay. He isn't. Um, and now, he's about to be real not okay. Yeah. Because uh, then this party is busted up by the police who arrest Linda. Yeah. And I wrote, what did she do? Like literally, what on earth did Linda do? Which apparently I was not the only one asking that question. Peter also did not know what she did. Um, Except for that she kind of had an idea that they were there for her because when the police got there, his first reaction was to find her. Yeah. And I think it's just because, like, he knows that Linda has done petty stuff in the past and we get to see what those petty things are. Well, but also, like, he doesn't really know... I mean, he's 
he's been implicated in some messed up stuff too that he didn't do, but like, it's, yeah. Um, so then we find out what she did do. Peter is, and Destiny are having a lawyer, um, a meeting with a lawyer. And um, turns out that apparently the FBI has decided, and I don't know if this is based in reality or not. Um, I did not look it up. But the FBI has decided that um, the Romani people are officially being categorized as a organized crime unit. So basically they're calling the Romani people a new mob. And so all of her petty crime, because it's as part of a mob organization, is being like Looked lumped at together with... as racketeering. Yeah. Because apparently she stole an elephant from the circus. That was, I, they listed a bunch of the things that she did and that was the only one that I was like, Really, Linda? <laughs> but of course, the, the, the lawyer was like, what do you need an elephant? What did she need an elephant for? And Peter goes, she knew a guy. <laughs> so like, he's not helping the mob, the mob look any by saying shit like that. Yeah, she knew a guy. Um, so the lawyer says that her retainer is $20,000 and that the mom or that Linda has been sent back to Hemlock County for processing. And then shit gets real real about um, some pretty intense uh, racial issues with prisons because mm -hmm. obviously he says like she's not black or Hispanic, but like white people don't really consider gypsies part of the race either. He says, he calls, like, says Aryan, the Aryans in there will want to finish the job that they did. Because, I mean, in World War II, in the concentration camps, Jews were not the only people. Like, obviously the Jews were the worst of it, but the Romani people were also severely, like, oppressed and killed and horrible horrible things so like he's real freaked out about her going to prison not because she isn't wrong but because mm -hmm. the racial politics of prison will leave her very unprotected yeah um so he has to go back to hemlock grove which so also, was, it's a little misleading because he doesn't go back to Hemlock, Hemlock Grove to get the money. He goes back to Hemlock Grove to stay with Destiny and to figure things out for Linda. And like, he's not, he's not even sure what he's, how, if, how or if he's going to get money. He just has to go back. Well, he, well, yeah, because I feel like him and uh, Linda, they obviously didn't have a stable place. So what was he going to do? I like, guess I'm like, he had to go back in that yeah. way because if they're hopping around the countryside, you know, going yeah. to Yeah, and so, like, De Destiny was like, you can stay with me. Like, that's, mm -hmm. um, then, um, as soon as, but then as soon as they, they're driving, and as soon as they hit the town border, sorry, you were sitting still for so long, I thought you were frozen. Oh, no, I was just, so, <laughs> As soon as they hit the town border, um, he starts having weird visions again. Um, and I didn't, it was too fast and flashy to like get all of it, but there was snakes again, mm -hmm. and the dude in the mask from the beginning of the episode, and a bridge. So, and well, he, and so a, a whip, a whip a coiling, like a whip coiling up, yeah. So that's interesting. So he's getting his freaky dinky Dutch dreams again as soon as he enters Hemlock Grove. Um, Wolf powers activated. Wolf powers. <laughs> Wonder twins. Um, then we go to uh, Godfrey Institute where there's a board meeting. And uh, my note says Roman's being kind of a dick. 
Yeah, Roman said, I have money now. I'm not a little boy. I'm gonna go to random countries and fuck random women. And um, it's He didn't go to a random country. He went to Hawaii. He said, have, any, of you been, he said, have any of you been to Maui before? Oh, I'm an idiot. Ignore me. But he went to another state <laughs> and had sex with a random girl and then put her nudes on the board meeting wall for everyone to see her 12-year-old boy looking ass body. Because that's what that was. There yeah. Were nudes on the and he was like, we should stop using our medical research to, like, build organs for old people. We should, like, use our medical research to make tits and cocks, basically. Yeah, and to, like, make, like, the youth more youthful. He said we should, uh, focus on the youth experience. And, like, you try, it sounds like you're trying to sell, like, a, like a, like a, like a timeshare or whatever. It's like, not timeshare. Um, my brain's not working. It is 9 a.m. I've been up for an hour already. Static is what's in my head. It's like he's trying to sell, like, um, supplements. Pill. It's like a 50 year old man who like lost his testosterone. We got to keep the youth experience. Like, no, Roman. But, and then he like went after Price and he was like, what is all this, uh, it, all this money like that is going to miscellaneous R&D? And uh, Price was like, it's R&D. That's miscellaneous. And he's yeah, like, but yeah, that I can, I can understand where Roman is like confused about, which we find out later kind of what that has to do with, and it has to do with helping Roman, but why not tell him that? So well, he knows that his money a, is- A, he can't tell him in front of the oh, yeah. whole board, and B, Price doesn't trust Roman because of what he did to Olivia. True, but also, Roman was very understandable for what he had to do, what he did to live Olivia, because he's like, I won't be no vampire bitch. You did this, and you made me have sex with my sister cousin. So I'm kind of pissed at you, die. So I understand where Roman came from with that. And then mm-hmm. Roman questioning where this funding is going is a reasonable thing for him to question if that's his money that he's spending. And he's like, okay, but so here's the thing. Yes, but the way he did it was very condescending in a in a place where he doesn't really quite belong yet. Like he's been in this company for 14 seconds and he thinks he's the most powerful person in the room purely because of money, which is a jackass thing to do because he doesn't know anything about what they do. Very true. Um and Price handles it well. He's like, we can talk about this in a sidebar conversation. So then they go to Price's office, but really they don't go to Price's office. They go to watch Roman piss, which was so weird. Um, yeah. That was actually the second time we watched someone piss in this episode. Yep. Um, so, but uh, Price is basically like, you wouldn't physically comprehend all of the things we're doing and we do them to keep you and your family safe. So, like, just drop it. Like, that's always been the way your family lets me do it, as I do it my way. You don't ask questions. Just know it's to protect you. And Roman mm. is not having that. Yeah. Which may, because, again, we are still very fuzzy on Price's motivation in all of this. It may yeah. be smart that Roman is questioning but it may also just be a jackass thing because he wants to separate himself from his mother. Yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of both in it. Right. But I feel like at the current moment, it's more of the, I want to be spiteful to mom. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, then we see what Olivia is up to. And my note says Monica was right. Because her voice is, in fact, very different. Um, yeah, I gotta say, I'm really glad they did because if you're, could you imagine having to like your tongue get put back in you and you have to learn to speak again? You're not going. You're not, and you're not right. No, they did it. They did it in a really good way. They explained the change. They ex- like 
they showed Olivia's hatred for the change. Like I did thought thought that whole thing was really, really well done. The way she said she's like, it sounds like a shook chord. And I was like, you why are you talking like that? <laughs> she's all, so yeah, basically, um after uh Roman ripped out her tongue, they did not put her tongue back in. Basically, Price formed a new tongue out of muscle from her leg and did it that way, which is so strange, but like probably medically accurate. I don't know. Um, I know you can do like transplants from like other parts of your body. I just, the tongue is a muscle, but like that would mess, like, I just can't imagine like. There's no taste buds. Yeah, she probably has no taste buds anymore. But yeah, so I don't know. But because of that, she also has obviously, apparently, she was in a coma for two months. Oh, wait, we do know how long it's been. Vaguely. No, 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 because he said she was in a coma for two months, and then he said this is week four of this process. So it has been three months total. Three months since that. Okay, okay. Which Peter's hair could not have grown back in three months. And um, something else that happens later doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, but it also does make sense. Yeah. Um, unless he said 14 weeks. I think it was, I think it was 14. I, because I didn't write it down. It was either four or 14. It was either four or 14. 14 would make a lot more sense. But, like, do you want me to go back and check? No, that is way too much time wasting. But, especially because, who cares? But, so maybe let's go with 14 because that seems more reasonable. So then it's been almost six months. Yeah. Which is still pushing it a little bit, but I'll buy six months more than three months. Yeah. Um. um. But Olivia and Price are, uh, they're having, you know, this conversation. Clearly, Price knows that they are vampires. Yeah. And, um, and Olivia and Roman don't, well, Roman does not know Olivia is alive. No, no, he, he knows she's alive. I thought, I was getting the vibe that he didn't. No, he knows she's alive, and we find this out later. We know she's alive, but he has not visited her once. Oh. And he hasn't asked Price about her. He's pretending she doesn't exist. He's ignoring her, which is breaking her heart. But she's oh. too physically weak to do anything about it. She can't go to him. Yeah. So. And I'm like, well, you did make your cousin, you did make your son screw his sister cousin and turn him into a vampire when he didn't want that. So then Bryce and Olivia are pondering how Roman is satiating himself. So we get, we get a flash to how Roman is doing this, which disturbed me. So this old man He's, yeah, he's at this apartment with this really creepy old guy. And the old guy's like, you can't get enough of me, can you? And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, Roman, you do not have why stop. No. And, and I thought it was going to be, like, a Damon Salvatore situation where, like, he, like, compels people to let him feed on them and, like, sex. And it was gross and I was really uncomfortable. Um. Yeah. And then he's like, and then the old guy goes, pay first, and then we play. And I was literally starting to freak out. I was like, no, 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 no. And he starts unbuttoning his shirt. And I literally almost had to stop watching it. I was like, I can't. I can't do this. Roman's getting freaky with an old man. Like, he was a creepy old man. True. But hey, at least he didn't have sex with him. He just ate leeches off of his body. 
yeah, so when he finishes unbuttoning his shirt, we see that his body is covered in leeches, which Roman then takes and puts in a plastic bag to put in his fridge so he can just keep eating leeches. And then he's like, you want me to start growing another crop for you? And he's like, yeah, start tonight. And he's like, well, it'll take a bit longer. And he's like, I want double more than last time. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Um... My notes are a little disjointed, so I apologize if I skip things. Um, I, know, I know what comes up next because I just see one really sad note. Um, Peter shows up at Roman's house. No, I know this is next because my note says Roman's new house is obnoxious. Uh, facts. Um, so apparently with all this new money, Roman has got himself a new house, which we see like basically the ruins of the old house mm -hmm. like everything's covered in blankets and stuff and then we see this shiny new house mm -hmm. obnoxious yeah. so peter goes in to beg roman for money Very bold of him to do right off the bat. I will have to say that. Yeah. Like, where Peter left Roman after everything had happened, why was he just going to expect, hey, bro, it's been a minute. Can I borrow 20 grand from you to get Linda a lawyer? And, Ro but, and Peter's like, don't do it for me, do it for her. Like, she was always good to you. Yeah, but Roman has such, he's so heartbroken that his boyfriend left him in his time of need that he's like, fuck you and her. She did to herself. That's her problem, not mine. And, and Peter's like, I saved your life. And he's like, yeah, but Shelly saved yours and she died alone. And then Letha died and you left me. They were both gone and I needed you and you were gone. So you know what? Fuck you. You can't have any money. Get out of my house. Yeah. Which I honestly don't. And it was in this scene that I noticed that Bill Skarsgård put on a lot of muscle between the first season and this season. Like, he was a different shaped human being. He was a different shape. <laughs> yeah, no, he was. And honestly, but on, like, I think that was one of those scenes that were really well acted between the two of them. Yeah. Um, Clearly, they're going to be joining alliances once again, for obvious reasons. I just don't know how they're going to bounce back from, like, Roman being jealous and brokenhearted that he left him. I don't know. And, like, you broke up with me. And I then... Mean, are they? I don't know. I think are Roman they? is really pissed off because I think he's legit heartbroken. Yeah, no, 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 but I'm at... saying, I'm saying, are they really going to join forces again? I don't know. I do. I think they will because I think some this cult thing is going to be they're like, oh, well, look at us. The gang's back together. Except for only half the gang because everyone else is dead. So it's just Freddy and Shaggy being gay for each other. <laughs> Roman does kind of look like Fred and Peter's a scruff. <laughs> you cracked the code, man. You cracked the code. You're welcome. To our listeners, so that makes that. so that makes Letha, Daphne. Wait, no, wouldn't that make Letha Velma? Because isn't Shaggy supposed to be with Velma? Yeah, but Daphne's the pretty one who everyone's in love with, especially Fred. Fred didn't have a choice in that scenario. That was his sister cousin. And Shelly is Velma because she's the only one who knows what the F is going on. That is also very true. And, uh... Peter, Peter isn't fucking Shaggy. He's Scooby because he's a fucking dog. I was gonna say, Christina could be Scooby. She chose to be a dog. We cracked the code. We cracked the code. Hemlock Grove's version of Scooby-Doo. Uh, <laughs> only everyone's dead. Yeah, except legit, it is only Shaggy. And Fred, yeah. and they're gay together and in love. I watched that movie. Same. I think we already. <laughs> I think it was just really bad. 
Um, so Peter goes back to Destiny to tell her that they didn't get the money, which I only took note about the scene. It wasn't really important, but um, there were two things that were important in the scene. One, Destiny's working at a like diner. Mm -hmm. which I don't understand. Yeah, because she was selling her, like, magic practices, like... Yeah. So I don't really know what happened there. And two, Peter refuses to eat. Yeah. Which is not a good sign. Yeah. Um, then we go to the rehab center that Olivia is living at. Oh no, no we don't. We go to the river where Norman and Marie are dumping Letha's ashes into the river and Marie still hates him. Yeah. Real awkward, they like dump the ashes together and then she storms off. But he's writing an email to Shelly and he's like, I wish I believed in heaven because then I'd see both of my girls again. Like I lost you and Letha and the baby that I never got to hold. And I just like, I'm so empty. I have nothing. I wish I could see you again. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the rehab center to give Olivia roses. And Olivia's kind of pissed that he's there. Yeah, I'm like, bro, you spent this whole time trying to get him to be in love with you, and they're like, no. But I think it's not about not liking him. I think there's two parts to it. One is that Roman has not visited her, not once, and she's buried her by that. And two... She's very much not in control. She's walking with a cane. Her speech is messed up. Her memory is going in and out. She's not herself. And she doesn't want Roman to see her in a position of weakness because she hates herself for being weak. Yeah. And that's understandable. Which is so, and that's in so in line with her character that anybody seeing her when she's not 100% on would make her hate that person. Yeah. So, like, it's not that she hates Roman because, or Norman, because she doesn't love him. She just, she resents that he is seeing her weak. Yeah, that's fair. And she tells that's him, fair. she's like, you don't have anything left. Like, your brother's dead, your daughter's dead, like... Why don't you run away? So you have millions of dollars. Why don't you run away somewhere exotic with a 25 year old and like go? And he's like, everything I want in my life, everything I care about is right here in front of me. And then she goes, what about your nephew? And I was like, damn. Like this man literally said, yeah, fuck my dead kid. I do everything I want. I ain't running away. I want to be with you. I left my wife right after our daughter died to be with you. Can you act like you enjoyed my presence? Thanks. Um, oh, but also, obviously, Norman still has no idea what Olivia really is. And he thinks yeah. that she had a seizure and bit off her tongue. Yeah, which, I mean, I don't know if that could happen. Yes. It 100% can. Okay. That, that's why, that's why when someone's having a seizure, you need to make sure that they're on their side so that they don't choke on or bite their tongue in a way that would obstruct their wind pipes. Okay. Fair. Sorry, I now, just had, I just had a PTSD trigger. Yo, same. Yeah. Um, whew. Then, Peter. Welcome to, 
all comes to me and Mary Kate literally having like a PTSD moment at the exact same time. Well, because it, it's the exact same moment. We were, it was you and me yes. in the room. Yes. It was not a fun-ass time. Oh. So yeah, by the way, seizures are fucking like really intense. So yeah, she could, she could have bitten her tongue off. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's that. And next, after this, we go to Peter. Peter correct? Yeah, he goes to meet up with these dudes. And I literally wrote, Peter, what the fuck are you doing? He said, I'm getting that 20 grand one way or another. So he picks up these drug dealers. He says he's going to sell them some stuff that is worth 20 grand. That it is the most crazy, crazy stuff. He also then says that the Egyptians and the gypsies were the same people and he built the pyramids, which I don't think that's true. <laughs> I wouldn't know. You're the one who knows more of the historical background. Not yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that's true. Doesn't really sound true, but if we're wrong, let us know in the comments because yeah. Um, us so he brings these drug dealers, and he's telling him that this stuff is like super intense and like gonna give them like the craziest high ever, and mm -hmm. um. And he puts this like stuff in their eyes and it burns and they're like, yo, I don't feel anything. I don't think I'm high. And he's like, just wait. And then, oh, Peter, he does the most amazing thing ever. So he starts to transform into a wolf. Um, we get another glorious transformation. Um, we see one of the scenes that we saw in the trailer of the season, um, and it's where Peter's nose starts coming out, and then his human hand, you see it come pull back inside his body and then go out of his mouth, like out of the wolf mouth, and he touches the one dude's face, and then he takes it back in, and then slinks it back out of that armhole. Like, it was disgusting, and like, obviously that's something that cannot be done practically, but they made it look so real and visual that I'm not even mad about it. I'm and, uh, not even So as this transformation is happening and the drug dealers think that they are high and seeing shit and hallucinating, the one drug oh, dealer just starts bombing. Yeah. And my note says that drug dealer is me. <laughs> yeah. That's me. <laughs> That's very fair. Um, but yeah, again, it's another beautiful transformation. But the only issue with this glorious transformation, he changed on the wrong moon. So he is headed down a very bad path because after he gets the money and gives the drug dealers well, stuff. Well, before we move on, um, my notes for this scene, first I said that drug dealer is me. Then during, and the moment when he touches the dude's face, I wrote, not okay, bro. <laughs> he said, let me caress your face with my juicy hand through my mouth. And then my note, my next note is, what the fuck did he actually sell them? I think it was just salt water that you put in your eyes. I legit think he just gave them salt water. No, he gave them a powder and told them to mix it with ionized water and like a bunch of stuff. He gave them something. I just don't know what the F it was. Um, but that's my question. Like, I'm real curious as to, obviously... He's conning them, and they are going to, like, say that this stuff is really good because of what they saw. But, like, what is it? What is he about to sell? No clue. I thought it was just salt, like, a salt water solution is what he made him No, make. because he gave them a powder and told them to mix it with ionized water, not tap water, and gave them eyedroppers. And was like, I'm going to give you guys some eyedroppers because I like you. Yeah. Um, so Roman did a successful deal, not Roman, Peter did a successful deal, got his 20 grand, they're getting the lady retained, they're, the lady lawyer, as they like to say, they keep saying the lady lawyer, 
Um, because they've never met a female lawyer before. Yeah, we're gonna get a lady lawyer. Um, but then um, Destiny comes home the next day after Peter collapses after doing this transformation. It wasn't a full transformation. He never transformed into a wolf. He transformed back to a human after partially transforming. Yeah, but um, he left some of his skin hanging around. And uh, Destiny was not super thrilled about that one. And she's like, hey, hey, bud, what the fuck is this? What are you doing? You changed was, on the wrong moon. Yeah, she was pissed that he changed on the wrong moon. She was pissed that he took her car to do this nonsense and then left her at work and she had to walk home. She was pissed that he brought the drug, drug dealers to her house because if they ever find out it was, a, it was a con, they now know where they live. Mm-hmm. And then she was pissed that he didn't get 25000 instead of 20000 even. Yeah. She was just not having it. She's like, you could have, she's like, listen, you did take advantage of them. I didn't want you to. And even though you did, you didn't get more than what you wanted. What you she was like, gotten. you couldn't, you couldn't have at least gone for 25. Yeah. She was like, where's the rest of it? Where's my money? Well, no, where's oh. the rest of the money? Because the retainer is 20,000, but who knows what else they're going to have to pay for. Exactly. Let me sell him some more fake shit. Yeah. So, um, then and Destiny says something very important. She's like, "You're on the path to becoming a Vargulf if you yeah. already are." Yeah. So she's like, "You don't know what." She's like, "You don't know what turning on the wrong moon can do. You don't know what the price is. This is now twice that he's done it." Yes. And so, like, she's like, "You could already be. It could already be too late. Like, you don't know." Yeah. Which is scary. Um, then he goes to get a job. Yep. At a tow truck company. Which, I mean, he doesn't really have any skills. True. So, like, that's fair. Um, but then, the guy at the tow truck company was a big old asshole. Mm-hmm. He said that he did not hire, he listed off all the things that he doesn't hire. He doesn't hire dope heads atheists atheists communist nancy boys or jews yep uh peter is one and a half of those things yeah because he's definitely high all the time and he may or may not be gay so yeah but very small on that one yeah but he's definitely not an atheist or a jew true i don't think he's a communist but i think that adds some spice to his character that i don't think anyone would want yeah Mm -hmm. but as he's trying to get a job he sees the television and the news is on and the bridge is some, they said it was somewhere in New York. Yeah. But I didn't catch what city they said it was in. I think. No, it wasn't Ithaca. No. Ithaca. But it was definitely on the like Hudson River area of New York. It was not on our side of the state. Yeah. Um, but there was a bridge and a dad and his infant son. So again, a child dead. Yep. It, it appeared as if they fell off a cliff while hiking. Who was hiking with an infant? Exactly. That is sketch AF. But Peter gets real distracted because the bridge is the same bridge from his vision. Mm-hmm. Um, then we go to Roman who is sucking leeches down in his kitchen and decides he needs more. So he goes to a club and he finds a girl. And honestly, the the interaction between him and the girl and her date was real smooth. I was real impressed with him. It was smooth. If I was that girl, I also would have left the club with him. Same. I would have just left the club with him regardless if he wasn't that smooth or not. I'd just be like, okay. 
It's Bill Skarsgård. Yeah, but like, I'm a decent human being and you're not. Exactly. Um, but he was real smooth. And the dude who was with her was a jackass. And he was like, yo, she's mine. And Roman was like, you're his, you're his property. And she was yeah. like, no. She was like, but he has a temper. He has anger problems. And Roman was like, cool. Bah! Knocked him the F out. Not without cause. The dude got up and tried to fight him. Yeah. And he, like, he didn't just punch him for no reason. Yeah, he got up and he was getting ready to swing. And then Roman literally like, undercuts him and he passes out. And then he takes the girl's drink and puts it in his hand so it makes it look like he passed out because he's drunk there. Well, the thing that was real smooth, though, he walked up to her. He was like, can I buy you a drink? You look lonely. She's like, I have a drink and a date. He goes, neither of those things stop you from being lonely. And I was like, oh. Yes, you can't take my pants off. Amanda's being saucy. So then they start to go back, they're going back to his house and she's doing some coke in his car and trying to touch his pee-pee and, um... (laughs) Did some coke in his car, she touched his pee-pee? Like, what? (laughs) Okay, yeah. Oh, they really like their coke in the show, obviously. Um, and he and starts he- getting distracted by her blood. He's thinking about her pulsing blood, and he's staring at her neck. And then he's like, no, damn it, I am not this person. I am not a bad person. Get the F out of my car. It made her walk home in the rain, in heels. Yeah, only they're in literally the middle of the nowhere. It's pouring rain. And she's like, are you serious? He's like, yes, get out of the car. And then he just, like, grabs her by her neck. And pushes her out of the car. Like, she moans and he get, she gets grabbed. So, like, we clearly know what you're into, sister. Uh, my note says, I'm glad he didn't kill her, but also, bro. Yeah. He had dropped her off at, like, a bus station or what <laughs> back. He could have dropped her off at a bus station. I mean... He's like, no, I don't want to be an asshole. I don't want to kill this person. Let me just throw you out of my car onto the side of the road in the pouring rain instead. But I mean, think about it in terms of like Twilight. Because that I know that that will make sense to you. Edward could not, like at first, he literally could not even be in the same room as Bella. Fair. Like at this point, and Roman's never killed someone Mm -hmm. I don't think from what we can tell he's never done it that way yeah and he's like I can't even listen to her heartbeat anymore or I will kill her that's fair so like it was get out this moment or you die which still sucks for her like I'm not saying she's not fucked right now but like I'd rather walk home in the rain than die. Very true. Although if I didn't know that option two was death, I'd still be real pissed. Yeah. I'd be like, yo, what the fuck? You know, we had some going. You were cute. You punched my date in the face. Um, then he drives home and there's opera music playing in his house. And um he goes up to this weird room that he has to type a keypad in to get to the room. And there's an old lady with a rosary and a candle and a Bible sitting in the room. And she's like, it's been a long day. And he's like, it's okay, you can leave. Lucy's on her way. Then he goes into... Door number Ada. two that's locked. With the number two. Inside is literally a, like a padded cell. And uh, break babies in there. Incest baby. And um, still just like chilling, listening to hardcore opera music. And my note is like, um, first of all, why is he keeping the baby in a padded room? 
with a lady with a rosary guarding it. Because, like, it's not like it's a babysitter in the room with a baby. It is a lady praying to Jesus in a room outside of a locked room with a baby in it. Because I think Roman might think that it's unnatural because it was well um, it is unnatural because did you see the color eyes that that baby had that blue was not human true true so we got demon incest baby alien baby incest alien baby incest angel baby the only sister thing sister is cousin incest. incest rape baby i just none, none of this is okay none no. of this is okay no. Um, and that's the know. end of the episode. Yeah, and I really don't know where to even conspiracize for the next episode because yeah. they're going in any single direction from this. I have literally no theories. Yeah. And I think that's another reason I didn't really love the episode was because I was like, wait, but what? What's what happening I- next? Like, what comes? Oh, we skipped a whole scene. Oh, where the Ouroboros is now a grown-ass woman? Yeah. And apparently Dr. And, Price can speak Russian? Yeah, and also the thing that irritated me, because they were only doing this for the fact that the viewer didn't know what they were talking about, the woman would speak perfectly fine English, then randomly start speaking Russian, then randomly go back to English, then randomly go back to Russian. for literally it, was no like, one else. it was literally half a sentence in each. And here's the thing. I don't speak Russian. But I knew everything the lady said. Because she spoke half Russian, half English, you could put into context what she said. And a lot of the words had similar root words uh-huh. to English. So like I, I understood everything the lady said. When Price spoke Russian, I have no idea what he said. None. Yeah, I, and because I watch with subtitles, and they'll normally the subtitle someone... says speaking Russian. Yeah, so that clearly they're doing that purposefully for us to not know what they're talking about. Yeah, because whenever there's been a different language in the episode before, like when they had Romani or uh, Latin, they say the word. So at least I can go check the translator or read it to understand. Yeah, I was like speaking Russian. And that's what I hate I didn't when like subtitles about. do that. I hate when subtitles do that so much. It makes me so because it's not just the show. It happens a yeah. lot in subtitles that when someone else is speaking a different language, um, they'll just say speaking whatever language. And I'm like, how am I supposed to understand what's going on? Yeah. And the one thing that irritates me is that about that scene. I understand that they were doing it for reasons to leave us out in the dark, but instead of having them speak a normal like, like, like speak like English, then to speak like normally, then to speak Russian halfway through, is doing nothing but making it more confusing from a storytelling point of view of like, why are you going back and forth between English, Russian, mm. English, Russian, no. half sentence? I have to disagree with that purely from a living in a country that you don't speak the native language standpoint. That's because there are, I have had so many conversations that are half Thai, half English in ways that don't make sense because it's what I know in Thai versus the person I'm talking to what they know in English. And like their conversations will be weird mixtures of both. That is fair. And her accent was thick enough that even when she spoke English, it was very clear that she was not American. She was Russian. So coming from the standpoint of having actually lived in a country where I don't speak the native language very well, I can tell you that that is genuinely how a conversation would go. That's fair. That's very fair. So I, that's why I was not bothered by any of that scene, except for the fact that the subtitles didn't have the Russian on the screen. Yeah. Um, well, it makes me concerned as to what they were talking about. I'm like, so what are you talking about? Well, basically, they were saying that the the baby should be ready to be awoken and living outside of the embryo in two weeks. Yeah, and it's not a baby. It's literally a grown woman that looks like Lisa. 
It really said Letha. Oh my god. <gasps> Peter's gonna see it and fall in love with it, and then they're gonna have another alien baby. How many alien babies can one show have? Well, this is our second one, so. We got alien babies up the ass over here and have my crow falling over. Come adopt one. So, uh, what do you want to punch? Um, how about the writer of the story? Because I really don't know what to do with this information. Just kidding. Um, who do I want to punch? Uh, well, let's just punch Olivia just for funsies. Okay. I, don't I really don't know because I'm I don't think Roman because he has a baby locked in a padded room and he left a girl out in the rain. Fair, fair. Uh, and then what's the other one? Our saving grace. Uh. The taxidermist tractor. No, that's a lie. <laughs> that no, that's why I want to punch in the face. That's a good. That's a good one to punch in the face. He is an asshole. Yeah. Um, uh, I just like destiny. That's what I was gonna say. Destiny is like the only person with her head on her shoulders this episode. Yeah, everyone else is kind of like fucked. <laughs> no, everybody's real sus right now. Yeah, like they're all playing among us, and they're all sus. Yo. Like, Oh my god, I gotta tell you the story real quick about my class today. We was in there in class, and um, I, oh, I had crazy heart palpitations today for some reason, like, in two of my classes this morning, my, like, my watch detected that I had a workout happening and I was running. Like, it said running, and I was just walking around the classroom like checking on kids' books. And I was like, yo, something is wrong with my heart. And I told my kids that like I was gonna die and that like I didn't know what was wrong with me. And they're like freaking out. They're like, no, Miss MK, you can't die. And I was like, no, you're right. I can't, it's really expensive to ship a dead body back to America. <laughs> and uh, then one of my kids stood up, just stands up. He's in the back corner of the class. He stands up and goes, dead body has been found. So I go, all right, all right, we got to hold an emergency meeting, emergency meeting. And my other kid, another kid in the back, pulls up a hand-drawn Among Us emergency meeting button and smashes the button. And we go, all right, Max being real sus right now. Who thinks he's the imposter? And everybody in the class raised their hand and go, all right, you're evicted. We won the game. Now, so what's on the board? <laughs> like. That's what my classroom is like. That's a time and a half, Mary. <laughs> That's a time and a fucking half. So, uh, yeah. yeah. That's that why I look like this today. I was that. This was, um, this week's episode, and, uh, <laughs> we're spiraling. We're really tired. It's been a long week. Um, but, you know, we still hope you guys enjoy it for what it's worth. You can uh, send us feedback at deathandaliens at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram and Twitter, both at deathandaliens. You can follow me on yeah. Instagram and Twitter at mk underscore superstar. mk is spelled E-M-K-A-Y. I don't really post anything on Instagram. So, but like, still follow me. Yeah, follow her. She's fun time. She'll like your posts. That's what she does with me. Yeah. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Moni underscore Lynn, double underscore Moni spelled M O N I E, and the double underscore is because someone stole my identity. And you can follow me on Instagram at Monica dot Lynn underscore for all. Your spooky, fun, festive needs. Just follow me. And with that, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.